starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in today's webinar hosted by the National Latina Network for Healthy Families and Communities, a project of Casa Esperanza that builds bridges and connections among research, practice, and policy to advance effective responses to eliminate domestic violence and to promote healthy relationships within Latino families and communities. My name is Jose Juan Lara Jr., team member of the National Latina Network and your host for today's webinar titled Sense of Community and Shared Identity in Latina-Led Domestic Violence Workshops. Sense of Community is positively linked to community participation and mental health. For this reason, connection to grassroots organizations in Latinx identity may help explain the success of Promotora and similar peer model programs. In this webinar, Dr. Lily Macias will present the results of a community-based study of domestic violence workshops led by Latina immigrant domestic violence survivors who completed Casa Esperanza's Adapted Leaderless Training Program. But before we start, I want to review a few house housekeeping details. Um, for the remainder of the webinar, participants will be kept on mute. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the chat box below. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the National Latina Network website. Any resources mentioned will be sent to participants after the call and will also receive a survey soon after exiting the webinar. We kindly ask that you fill it out since this really helps us shape future content for our trainings. I'd also like to invite you to join the National Latina Network for Healthy Families and Communities. Through the network, you will receive updates on public policy, research, and training opportunities. You can join the network by visiting our website at www.nationallatinonetwork.org. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Lily Macias, Assistant Professor at the University of New Haven in Connecticut. Connecticut. Welcome, Dr. Macias. Thank you so much, and it's my pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for everyone who's uh, taking the lunch hour to spend some time with us to discuss uh, 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 two aspects of uh, community capacity that uh, uh, are close to my heart, and I'm sure I, I share uh, this value with many of you uh, when it comes to building community connections uh, in your programs and work. So uh, if you're, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, my hope is uh, that uh, uh, through the course of this webinar, you'll become um, more familiar with uh, one of the uh, curriculums developed by Casa de Esperanza uh, that I'll be describing in collaboration with uh, another domestic violence uh, community organization in Atlanta, Georgia, Camino Latino. Uh, the Leadership Training Program for Latinas is also known as Lideres, uh, and it's a manualized curriculum that uh, was developed by Latina women for Latina women in order to uh, develop natural leadership abilities. Uh, and part of the aim of this program is to help uh, uh, and support women in developing and implementing their own uh, workshops in the community. Uh, and I'll be talking about a research study that uh, is looking at domestic violence, violence workshops specifically. However, uh, uh, women are able to um, take what they learn from this program to um, develop workshops on a range of different health and social issues. Uh, and in fact, um, the women uh, that we've worked with in this program uh, have done just that um, and presented on uh, other issues like bullying and uh, also uh, use workshops as a means of uh, outreach in the community. Uh, I'm also hoping that uh, we'll be able to use this opportunity uh, in this webinar to exchange ideas uh, because I, I know that many of you are engaged in community building activities through your uh, various programs and initiatives or uh, your own individual work. And uh, in particular, I'm hoping we can identify and expand upon uh, some types of community engagement like testimonial that uh, is culturally relevant uh, and can uh, help 
uh, bring out the strengths of our communities in the context of DV prevention. So I want to begin by uh, discussing why it's important and why uh, uh, I and my colleagues were interested in evaluating and researching peer programs uh, like the Lideres program and similar promotora programs. Uh, and if you are engaged in this type of work, um, you know, one thing for you to know, and uh, importantly for funders to know, uh, is that uh, peer interventionists like promotoras uh, in many ways uh, are uh, able to be more effective than professional healthcare workers. Uh, and um, this is particularly true when we're talking about underserved and marginalized groups uh, like Latino families, uh, and in particular immigrant Latino families who may experience a range of barriers uh, to accessing traditional services, uh, including but not limited to language. Uh, and, you know, when we're thinking about traditional models of healthcare, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, research that can kind of direct us and inform uh, research and evaluation with peer models. And uh, one aspect of that research that I'm uh, very interested in, in is uh, the patient-provider uh, relationship. I'm also a, a therapist in addition to being a, a community uh, a practitioner and group facilitator. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, when we're working with uh, individuals from underrepresented groups, uh, the uh, patient provider, therapist, uh, uh, client, you know, nurse, patient, all of these relationships become very important. And we know that uh, certain things, including uh, shared identity or race concordance, uh, can influence the outcomes of this treatment. Uh, and when I say influence outcomes, I mean even uh, the quality of treatment. So, you know, people going to the doctor um, and getting uh, the right medications or uh, receiving follow-up. So, uh, you know, a lot of the research we have to rely on in understanding why uh, some health interventions work or don't work, you know, are in the tr traditional sphere. Um, and we have a kind of lack of studies examining peer models like promotoras uh, in the area of domestic violence prevention. And uh, there's a lot of value in these models when it comes to uh, the issue of domestic violence specifically because promotora models uh, are often more consistent uh, with Latina help seeking. So what do I mean by this? As many of you are uh, probably aware, uh, Latina and African American women are uh, uh, more likely and uh, prefer, uh, based on past research, to uh, seek out help in the context of family violence from uh, close relatives, friends, clergy, uh, and all of these are more kind of uh, community-based or uh, consistent with a peer model versus um, someone who uh, might be willing to disclose to a healthcare worker. Evaluation studies on promotora and community health worker and other similar peer programs like the Lideres also tend to focus on behavioral health outcomes. So. Uh, a good example is uh, diabetes healthcare management. So uh, you may look at these programs in relation to whether a person's able to manage their diet differently, insulin levels, uh, and uh, less so uh, do we see uh, other capacity measures like sense of community uh, and communication, community participation uh, looked at in this area. And in fact, I believe um, that this uh, may be the reason that we sometimes have um, mixed findings with uh, peer program research. Uh, and um, 
like the importance of the relationship in traditional settings, uh, I believe that uh, looking at uh, capacity measures uh, uh, within the relationship between a peer interventionist and a community uh, may be important for guiding future program development, development and research. So what do I mean by community capacity? Here you have a, a depiction of uh, our conceptual model that many of us already uh, uh, use to guide the work that we do uh, with communities. Uh, it puts uh, capacity building at the center and uh, capacity can refer to an individual or a group of people's ability to mobilize themselves around an issue like domestic violence. And we also want to take into account the different ecological levels of the individual, the family unit, uh, community, and social political. Uh, laws, policies, so on and so forth. And if you uh, want to uh, look more into this uh, guiding framework, uh, you can see uh, our recent publication in uh, the Latina Latino Psycho Psychology Bulletin. Uh, and myself and my colleagues became very interested in uh, a kind of um, finding out more about um, something that, uh, I mean, we were observing uh, just naturally in uh, the leadership program and in other uh, domestic violence group programming, uh, which is a sense of community as a dimension of a community capacity. Uh, a sense of community is something that I see as related to other uh, domains of capacity, including leadership. Uh, and communication, community participation, all of these uh, uh, things seem interrelated. Uh, and the advantage of looking at sense of community uh, is it often overlaps with uh, uh, things that we're already doing as community practitioners, uh, and that there's a good evidence base behind it. So what is sense of community? It's uh, uh, basic level, it's feeling part of a larger group. Um, this might be an ethnic group, but it might also be, uh, you know, the group of, of the, uh, a part of a group in, within the organization with which you work. Uh, it's an emotional closeness uh, that people describe. Uh, and importantly, um, in the context of health and um, social issues, uh, um, many define sense of community as one's ability to have their needs met. Now, these needs may be emotional, they may be social, uh, or they may be more practical. Uh, and uh, finally, consistent with uh, our participatory framework that we take for uh, all of the work that uh, we do, uh, it, it often means having uh, a feeling that you have influence and that you're heard within your community. And as I mentioned before, sense of community uh, has a strong research base, uh, and it's mostly been uh, uh, built uh, by community psychologists who were engaged in community-based research. So uh, sense of community is uh, um, related to a host of, of good outcomes, including just general mental well-being and mental health, quality of life, psychological empowerment, uh, and as I mentioned before, community participation, which is also another uh, dimension of community capacity. Uh, sense of community is protective against uh, a number of mental health issues, including um, and uh, as most strongly documented uh, depression. So, um, you know, part of why we know this is that uh, uh, some community uh, researchers uh, um, from the field of community psychology uh, decided to uh, uh, take it upon themselves to do the work of developing good measurement skills. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm going over this in a little more uh, detail than I'm, I might uh, with um, other audiences because I think the um, brief sense of community scale um, has value uh, not just for uh, research and programs and evaluation, uh, but also as a tool that uh, organizations can use uh, to see how they're doing uh, with uh, a community building efforts uh, and as uh, a kind of measure of uh, for their own internal use. Uh, so the brief scale that uh, is included in the study I'll be talking about today is um, only seven items and you all know that's really important to have brief scales uh, when you're doing community work. Uh, and uh, for the purposes of our study, you know, uh, we um, had a, a bilingual form. If people are interested, I'm happy to share that with people. And I uh, also recommend uh, um, taking these forms, um, any forms that have a, uh, been previously validated or reliable, uh, and um, bringing them to community members um, to adapt and change in terms of language to fit your local community. Uh, a few of the sample items from the scale um, that are answered on a 10-point uh, Likert scale, you know, um, zero uh, is strongly disagree, 10 is strongly agree, uh, are I have a voice of, about what goes on in this community and I feel close to others in this community. Uh, and so this, I, I chose these items um, in part because, again, uh, you know, this uh, construct of sense of community uh, so closely uh, overlaps with uh, um, uh, what many of us value about participatory uh, community work and the idea that uh, our, our community members can have a voice in the programs and also the research that uh, is being implemented in their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and to get a little bit more into this uh, participatory approach that we use for the Lideres program, uh, you know, it included from the start, uh, um, and both uh, uh, Josie Serrata and myself uh, were involved in the um, training of uh, the Latina Lideres in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and it, it became very important for us to have regular evaluation meetings with all stakeholders, including the Lideres, in order to uh, adapt the program uh, and include them uh, in any evaluation or research effort. I just want to give you all like, a flavor of what um, these women uh, uh, developed in terms of the training and uh, what's kind of included in the curriculum. Uh, this is um, a table of just the first four sessions. Um, the training can be completed uh, in, in, you know, about six weeks. And uh, it includes uh, a community building, uh, community building aspect in the early sessions. Uh, and also uh, explores topics like uh, leadership identity, a community, uh, and you see in session four that uh, women start to develop presentation skills and practice presentations as well. And again, this is uh, curriculum is available through Casa de Esperanza, uh, and it has been implemented in um, other sites across the United States, uh, uh, not just Atlanta. But I'm going to turn to the current study uh, um, because, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, um, research on uh, peer-led programs, including Vida um, uh, uh have focused in the past on the effects on the peer leaders or uh, leaders going through trainings themselves, uh, including um, some of uh, our published uh, research on this topic. So uh, uh, I and my colleagues were very interested in looking on the broader impact of, of these programs on community members attending workshops 
as that's a, um, uh, one of the main aims of the program. Um, so for the study, we collected survey data before and after uh, two uh, Lideres-led DV workshops. Um, they were led by two or three uh, of the Lideres. And uh, we also collected data uh, from uh, what I would call control uh, activities that were also kind of community in, uh, uh, engagement activities. Uh, one was like a, a Zumba class that uh, um, was held out of a Latina-owned salon. And another uh, uh, was a parenting class uh, that was um, led by um, staff members that were unrelated to the Lidades program. And for this uh, study, uh, I, I really wanted to get at this basic assumption about um, Pierre and Pomodoro models uh, because I think it will help build up the literature base and help guide future uh, research and uh, studies in this area. Um, essentially, uh, I hypothesize that sense of community uh, might influence as a capacity measure how peer leaders are uh, received by community members. Uh, and I'll explain this a little bit more uh, in detail as we go along, uh, but, uh, but I also want to point out that we collected, in addition to this, some evaluation data uh, that was qualitative, so eliciting, eliciting feedback from uh, the women that attended the workshops so that we could um, get a sense of uh, uh, their needs for future workshops and uh, um, their opinions and uh, thoughts about the program. And for uh, th that qualitative data, we, we had no uh, expectations. We just wanted to see what uh, emerged from the data. So uh, measures that uh, we included in these uh, um, uh, individual interviews, uh, which uh, were um, conducted by trained bilingual uh, research assistants, uh, and uh, you know all the questions were read so as not to assume literacy, and it was more of a conversation with attendees. Um, as I mentioned before, um, brief is the key word in community uh, practice and research, so. Uh, we needed to get these things done fast so that we weren't uh, taking up time in the workshops or taking up um, time out of people's day. So we asked questions about demographics briefly, past experiences with DV services and uh, the issue of domestic violence uh, in terms of knowledge. Uh, we asked about the perception of the workshop leaders with a single item, again, to keep things brief. Uh, and that uh, item was, um, I feel that the Camina um, Latino Lideres uh, are a part of my community. Now, you can see with, with an item like that how it might be important for people to have a pre-existing sense of connection to a community uh, before they would feel that uh, a peer interventionist was a part of that community. And uh, that's precisely what I was uh, interested in looking at. Uh, qualitative data for this study uh, was uh, collected and analyzed using, using a modified grounded theory approach. Um, the important thing about that is that uh, consistent with the participatory methods, uh, we were uh, looking for um, uh, different perspectives, not just from the researchers, but uh, from uh, the participants themselves at different time, time points. So we also went back to participants to share preliminary findings and get their feedback. So the participants uh, in this workshop study, uh, in brief, 
were uh, 53, uh, um, mostly women with children uh, between the ages of 18 to 62 years. We had some pretty similar groups with respect to those who attended workshops and interacted with Amiradas and those that did not. And reflective of uh, the larger uh, Atlanta community, uh, most of uh, the individuals of this study were uh, immigrant Latinas from uh, Mexico, but also a, a host of other uh, Latin American countries. Um, and we have a very uh, diverse community um, in um, the urban area of Atlanta. So um, to get right into the findings, uh, uh, consistent with past research um, that shows that promotora models, one of their, the things that um, uh, they show uh, uh, good evidence for for access or connecting uh, individuals from a community to uh, needed resources and services. Uh, and in fact, uh, two thirds of the workshop participants were interested in utilizing uh, the uh, um, Latina leaders for uh, referrals for help, not just for domestic violence, but also other. Um, issues they were facing, and also not just for themselves, but for others. And this was a cross condition. So uh, even uh, women just hearing about the program and attending some other community uh, event uh, more uh, express interest in utilizing the program for these purposes. Um, the workshop attendees specifically uh, rated workshops very highly. And we also found effects for uh, the test of the hypotheses I described early, earlier. So we found effects for perceptions of Latina leaders based on um, uh, uh, past CD experience and an interaction effect between sense of community and workshop attendance. Uh, so I want to bring your attention to this past DV experience because this was a variable that was included in the model, um, not because it was hypothesized, but because it passed screening uh, and was related to the variables of interest. Uh, and as it turns out, this became a very interesting finding in my mind uh, once you look at the, uh, it in, uh, in conjunction with the qualitative findings. But I'm going to pause that and talk a little bit and explain the interaction effect between sense of community and workshop attendance. So uh, here you'll see a table. And uh, the values in the tables and numbers uh, are, are basically scores for sense of community, as I've described. So uh, the higher the number, uh, the higher uh, individual's um, sense of uh, community connectedness. And these are mean scores across participants. So uh, the interaction effect, which was significant in terms of differences between scores, um, shows that uh, we had differences between um, the workshop and control activities um, and um, how people identified uh, the Latina uh, leaders in terms of that question. And the question I'll say again was, um, I feel uh, the women uh, from the leaders program are a part of my community. Uh, Lily? Uh-huh. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question here. Um, yeah. Are the leaders similar to promotoras? Do they have a similar role in the community? I don't know if you're going to cover this, but... That's one of the questions. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so actually, uh, 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 I'm glad you asked that because I think um, given the discussion we're going to have about shared identity, the Lidera's background is, is very important. And I, I didn't have time to go into the full uh, evaluation of the impact of the training program on the women themselves. 
but uh, the women were recruited um, from the domestic violence organization Camino Latino, uh, and all were uh, past survivors of domestic violence uh, who had uh, gone through uh, um, the uh, support group programs at Caminar Latino. And um, they were identified because um, at, um, not just the leaders, but it, it is a common thing at Caminar. And I'm, I'm sure uh, other people will have a similar experience that people who go through the support groups um, tend to come back or stay. Uh, and uh, all these women were staying in the groups uh, beyond the required time uh, and had, had often shift their roles within the groups to offer support to the other women. So um, they had no formal experience in, uh, you know, uh, in the sense of how we think about community health workers or promotoras uh, uh, providing health intervention uh, before the Lideras uh, training. So, uh, did that, uh, I hope I answered uh, that question fully, and if not, please uh, feel free to ask more. Thank uh, you. No problem. And so you look at this table again, I mean, there's an obvious uh, different value, and that's uh, you have a low identification with workshop leaders with, uh, with the workshop condition. And this did kind of have me scratching my head a little bit because, um, you know, uh, uh, you do kind of uh, get the sense that a workshop would have a kind of um, engaging quality and that that would um, uh, lead to a sense of connection among co community members. But I think what uh, this finding really speaks to is that uh, pre-existing sense of community connection, of identification with a group. Remember how we had said sense of community is identification with a group. If you're not feeling a part of that group or part of that community, um, it may be hard uh, for you to uh, um, necessarily um, trust or connect with um, someone on just on the, that basis. And uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about this, um, but what really became interesting to the story was the addition of the qualitative data. And I think that really deepened and helped explain what was going on. And the chief uh, finding or qualitative theme that came out and emerged from uh, the interviews with uh, the uh, workshop participants was this idea of a sense of connection to uh, the larger cultural specific organization. And uh, we believe, uh, uh, the researchers who work on this, that uh, this explains why uh, some people uh, felt willing um, uh, and even connected to the uh, Lideras, even without interacting with them uh, directly. So even the people who were recruited from the salon, from uh, you know the Zumba class, uh, many people knew about Camina Latino uh, because Camina Latino isn't just involved in domestic violence advocacy, but also is involved um, in the Latino community in a number of ways in community engagement. Uh, you know they're very visible at health fairs and uh, uh, you know different community events. Um, so it seems that uh, um, participants in this study were uh, willing to extend that sense of connection to the larger organization, to the leaders themselves. And here you have one woman who's, who, when answering the sense of community scale, uh, even said, um, well, now I feel more connected with what a community is. Uh, and she attributed this to her experiences with the organization. Also representative among the uh, 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 participants in this study uh, were um, 
uh, were, were an interest and in, expressed interest in the community leaders' testimonies of their own experiences of violence. So this was about 10% of the sample. Uh, it seemed to be a lot of people who uh, were in, uh, in the workshops. So, um, you know, for this reason, you know, it, 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 it may have a, a greater um, impact in terms of guiding future directions for, for uh, this program in particular. Uh, but essentially, uh, the Lideras, when they were delivering their workshops, it's, uh, uh, they have an amount of time where they give testimony of their own experiences. This was an adaptation of the program in some ways because the program was originally developed to be um, implemented uh, by um, uh, Latina women regardless of their own experience with domestic violence. Uh, but um, I, I think when you think about this qualitative theme uh, together with the finding um, uh, quantitatively, remember I told you earlier that I included past DV experience in the uh, quantitative logistic regression analysis uh, because it's strongly related to the variables of interest. And, uh, you know, what I've come to, to, how I've come to think about this is um, that there is a kind of intersection of shared identity. Uh, and just like um, past research has shown that um, some aspects of shared identity in uh, general health care can be really important and powerful, uh, I, I think also um, that um, just like a lot of us are aware of in our own community work, um, you know, we can have uh, a, a meaningful connections uh, and experiences that can inform our work with community. Uh, and in other words, if you can think about the statistic, you know, that one in three uh, women may have an experience of of um, intimate partner violence. And you have um, a peer program where people are um, speaking to a group of uh, community members. You might expect that a good proportion of them would have their own experiences. Uh, and in this case, um, uh, our view that as past experiences were violent, with violence uh, become a strength. Uh, in terms of their ability to engage uh, community members. And uh, uh, not only are they a strength, but um, testimony in past research has be been found to uh, have benefits for um, those who uh, share their stories as well. Very briefly, because I want to make some uh, time, too, for us to discuss, there were a few other qualitative themes that emerge. Uh, remember that I, uh, we weren't particularly looking for uh, expecting anything from the qualitative data, but we did want uh, to get feedback on uh, the survey form as well as uh, the program itself to guide future directions. And uh, um, when thinking about what uh, people wanted out of uh, future program activities, a lot of it centered around family, uh, and in particular, um, adding workshops and um, gaining support around parenting uh, uh, youth. Uh, there was also some questions in the survey. Uh, that had to do with uh, another capacity domain of communication about social uh, uh, and health issues. And um, parents acknowledged that uh, domestic violence is a, a hard thing to talk to uh, children about. Uh, and they talked about uh, it being a sensitive topic that they weren't sure 
how to bring up and how to talk about. Um, so these are all kind of areas um, uh, I'm open to uh, uh, your experiences with and uh, that uh, could inform um, how these uh, this peer program goes forward uh, in Atlanta but also elsewhere. So I'm just going to end um, with the kind of implications of this study and I, then I want to open it up to discussion because uh, I'm particularly excited about uh, um, some of the things that weren't expected in this study uh, and um, you know for us to have a discussion about um, uh, how to uh, build sense of community connection uh, within our work. Uh, so uh, um, in general I, I think uh, something to take away from this study and that um, uh, if, if um, you are looking for funding, if you're looking to justify or to work on logic models or anything to help explain your work, uh, I think this is a good area of research to turn to because um, uh, you know, I think uh, from this study we can think about community building as a almost um, a first step in prevention efforts. Uh, that it works better, um, and to put it in simple terms, if um, people have uh, already a sense of connection to an organization or uh, the people that they're working with. Uh, I also wanted to highlight sense of community as a um, uh, uh, useful uh, and uh, validated, a uh, reliable measure that you can use for programs and organizations. And uh, finally, uh, highlight testimonial as a, a culturally relevant way uh, to communicate uh, knowledge and experience through these programs. And uh, with that, I hope to open it up to some discussion. I, of course, uh, have to thank uh, the Lideras program for uh, their help and uh, support in uh, both guiding this project. And the truth is it just would have never gotten done <laughs> if, uh, if the Lideras themselves hadn't um, advocated for it to get done. And, um, and then uh, I also want to thank um, uh, both Casa de Esperanza and Caminar Latino, uh, as well as um, the APA and Society for Community Research and Action for um, uh, supporting the study through grants. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, if we can open it up to discussion, I'd love to hear a little bit about what other people are doing in terms of community building. So yeah, just a reminder, folks, if you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat box below. <clears throat> um, and that, just a quick reminder that um, for folks who are interested in um, implementing or using the Lideres curriculum, you can, uh, there's, uh, in addition to that, there's also technical assistance that Casa de Esperanza can provide around how to use the Lideres curriculum, which can be found on our website, nationallatinonetwork.org. Um, yeah. So I have a question, Lily. Um, from your perspective, were there anything? Was there anything surprising that you were not expecting as far as, far as the research and the implementation of the Lideres model? Uh, well, you know, I think I think this idea of um, shared identity, um, in particular, shared um, identities of being survivors, uh, um, was not something that uh, we necessarily sought out to test or look at, uh, you know, kind of came about because of the basic of assumption of Comatora and peer models uh, that um, uh, they, they are uh, a, a more trusted 
source of knowledge um, on the basis of, of something like, you know, shared eth ethnicity. But I think this kind of um, adds um, uh, an intersectional uh, way of looking at uh, identity when it, when it comes to not just the people we work with, but also, uh, uh, you know, our own identities as uh, practitioners and researchers. Um, you know, you don't have to share um, the same experiences of the people you work with, but I think it was um, very powerful for uh, women survivors of domestic violence uh, uh, for, you know, for women to think about their experiences as a strength when it comes to the work that they do. I think also uh, an important point around that is um, having being part or having members of your own community take the lead there's also minimizes this whole expectation of explaining your cultural behavior for lack of a better word I think having the experience of working at a culturally specific organization there's certain things that I don't have to explain because I am you know I work for the Latino or community it doesn't mean that we're all the same but I think sometimes because there is this shared affinity around maybe food and language and cultural practices that it kind of minimizes some of that, having to translate some of these behaviors. Um, do you think that's why this happens? Why is this important? Oh, absolutely. And it, it definitely mirrors the, the uh, you know, uh, large uh, evidence we have in more traditional settings, you know, uh, in therapists working with uh, uh, patients or in with doctors relationships with their patients uh, and and there we see um, you know even if it's not talked about explicitly um, people know and are aware when their providers uh, you know um, understand their cultural background um, sometimes it is as obvious as, as shared language but most of the time it's not uh, and we know often things get um, uh, simplified to just language and uh, healthcare settings. So uh, I think the advantage of us um, starting to look um, within, um, you know, uh, uh, cultural specific programs is um, that we can see um, this more nuanced way of looking at it. Because uh, I, I think um, even when we have cultural specific programs like the Lideras, uh, we want to be thinking about how we're going to adapt the program for our local settings and for differences in things like uh, immigrant status. Because, um, uh, you know, one thing that we've done with the Lideras program is try to make it as adaptable as possible, uh, given our own observations that when the program started, it started in um, Yes, it was uh, um, used with um, uh, 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 Latina women, um, but a very different uh, sociocultural setting, uh, you know, from the uh, initial implementation to the adaptation. And it, this can be in terms of immigrant, immigrant status uh, and, you know, different, having different uh, uh, dialects or ways of living, uh, all those kinds of things. And I think I'm, uh, you know, particularly interested in hearing from other people because I think, you know, one thing is that the study highlights is that um, there are members of the Latino community that, um, uh, um, you know, we may need to um, engage in um, different ways uh, in order to um, build sense of community. Uh, and in particular, I think areas that are challenge, challenge, uh, have special challenges are like rural areas or uh, areas um, that may uh, not um, have a, a cultural specific organization nearby. Uh, and in this case, I think you know, uh, informal settings like churches uh, can be wonderful places to implement programs. I don't know what others think. 
So again, just a reminder, folks, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, I'm also curious, just like with any, and you may have mentioned this, and um, with any research or, um, or setting to discover some, you know, what your goal is for your research, was there any other um, things that you discovered along the way that you weren't expecting as part of uh, doing the research around the Leolis uh, model? Like you, you, you were assumed, but was you felt great that we're kind of affirming or this is totally did not expect this? Uh, you know, I think um, a natural um, question that I normally get about this uh, study is like um, about uh, looking about at, at other outcomes for, for workshops. So um, one thing I did look at that um, didn't turn out um, the way I thought was uh, I did ask about um, domestic violence knowledge to um, the workshop participants. And uh, I did originally expect that um, that would be an outcome of attending a workshop, that you would go to the workshop and that you would uh, uh, leave with uh, increased knowledge about uh, uh, issues of domestic violence affecting your community. So that might be like the forms of violence that violence takes, physical, emotional, uh, but it's also like the effect on um, violence on children that, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know, I do have some um, uh, uh, findings about specific aspects of that knowledge, in particular that um, uh, the item of, uh, of violence's effect on children, because um, it is a common myth that, uh, you know, if uh, children aren't exposed directly to violence, they're not affected. Um, and uh, that was one of the uh, learning objectives in the workshop. Um, however, um, uh, you know, uh, it seemed like regardless of whether women went to the workshop or didn't, uh, most of them had a general um, good sense of what domestic violence is and the forms it takes uh, and could identify that it, if it was happening or not. Um, so that was kind of an a interesting finding. I think it suggests that maybe um, the role of, of Fomatora and peer models in domestic violence might be one of more connecting community members to support uh, and resources uh, that are needed in order to cope with violence or, um, or uh, as you saw what many of those um, women asked for support about how to talk to their children about it and how to um, end the violence uh, uh, or, you know, end maybe intergenerational um, transmission of violence. So speaking of uh, children or youth, I have a question here. Um, have you done any uh, similar studies with youth, have you or do you believe it would be SOC, um, would you, would, would have a similar outcome? Oh yeah, and I think, I think Pamela Latino, uh, I, I had to, uh, I moved away from Atlanta, obviously I'm in Connecticut now, uh, where I came for a clinical internship and, and now working, but I'm at, they were interested in Casa de Esperanza does do a lot of uh, peer initiatives with uh, youth. And uh, I, I'm a strong proponent for this type of work, uh, particularly with teens and young adults, uh, because I do think um, uh, that if you look at the developmental literature in particular when it comes to youth adjustment, uh, you know, the one thing that stands out uh, even when you think about mentorship um, uh, programs and all kinds of school-based programs, you know, one thing that really stands out in terms of um, uh, helping uh, youth a positive adjustment is their participation in their community. 
Uh, so I, I think um, it would be uh, uh, have amazing benefits, and there is a very good uh, literature base to support uh, uh, implementing uh, the Lideres curriculum and similar curriculums with youth. So anyone interested in that kind of work um, uh, would have a lot of justification from the research literature, and if they're interested, they can contact me if they need uh, particular citations. Thank you. And again, this is something we Casa Esperanza can also provide some technical assistance. Um, as Lily mentioned, we also, as part of our um, community engagement practices, we do we have implemented this practice with uh, youth in, in uh, Casa Esperanza's community. Uh, any other questions from folks? Um, again, you can type them in the chat box. Yeah, I guess I'm curious if anyone uh, else uh, has experience or um, has done work with uh, uh, using testimonial. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, what is the preparation work that an organi organization needs to do in order to use the Lideris curriculum, or do they only need to need the desire? I know you may have answered that already. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it does take uh, some resources and time. I think um, I can tell you a little bit about how we pulled it off, uh, but I think every organization is going to be different, and that's how we're, uh, the technical assistance that uh, the National Latino Network and CASA provides uh, becomes so valuable. Uh, but, you know, um, I would say with our experience, um, uh, you know, it didn't take a lot in terms of uh, monetary resources, but uh, uh, across the six-week period in the summer, uh, we did need the space, uh, the organizational space uh, and time. Uh, and we also had to have a lot of uh, cultural considerations given uh, the group of women we worked with, a lot of them worked during the day, um, so we provided, uh, you know, child care so that they could attend the training. Uh, we also, uh, I'm, you know, I think that, you know, part of my interest in this whole area of sense of community is that I find myself justifying, um, you know, culturally sensitive and uh, community building activities a lot and grants. And if people are interested in, in that topic, you know, you know, you can follow up with me. But uh, it becomes really important with, when doing a program like this because, you know, providing child care and providing uh, food, which, um, you know, I, I think I, uh, for um, one of these grants I wrote, uh, I, I almost, I had a huge portion dedicated to uh, um, providing food at meetings um, because, you know, you're asking people to come um, at odd times of the day and the evenings, and you're taking out of their day, uh, and um, it's often after they've been working, and this is the time they would normally be having dinner. So, uh, you know, I think it, um, uh, when it comes to Im implementing this program, uh, yes, the, the most important ingredient is a desire. And then it's about adapting it to uh, the women you're going to be working with um, and co on considering their situation uh, and um, uh, um, making the most out of uh, the organizational resources you have available. And we, uh, we had a lot of volunteer support too. So, you know, um, students from the local university and uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Serrata and I um, uh, uh, were uh, students at the time under the uh, supervision of Julia Padilla at Georgia State. And uh, Dr. Serrata is actually Dr. Josie Serrata, who is our director of research here at the Casa Esperanza National Network, in case folks. Um, 
Also, another question. Um, in terms of fostering a sense of community, what were the lessons learned? And you may have answered this already. Uh, yeah, I think um, there's still, I mean, the biggest lesson learned is that there's more lessons that uh, uh, we need to learn. And it, it, it brought up a lot more questions about um, how we can articulate and justify um, community building uh, in uh, Latino initiatives around domestic violence. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, if you go back to this, I'm going to try to go back to this one. Uh, for um, some communities, community building might be just uh, the initial step you make as a program or organization. And it, you know, you see this mirrored in the Lideres program itself in the curriculum. The uh, first session is uh, 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 designed to kind of promote a sense of, of, of group identity. Uh, and I, um, I also think that whereas most past research has um, looked at peer programs as they relate to behavioral health outcomes, like, uh, you know, did I change my diet or did I uh, you take my medicine on uh, when, as I was prescribed, uh, you know, um, we're looking at um, more complex social issues when we're talking about domestic violence. And so I think sense of community and capacity measures really lend themselves to the, uh, the type of outcomes that we're interested in. I have another question, Lily. Mm -hmm. um, what about mainstream organizations using the, the Leodis curriculum? I think um, it's just very interesting because this particular uh, research was done with culturally specific with a culturally specific Latino organization. What about that? What about mainstream organizations that also identify as allies? What oh, I think uh, I think um, you know any anywhere that a program like this could be supported uh, would uh, be awesome and great. I think uh, just like um, I mentioned earlier, a lot of it, it a lot of uh, the adaptation of the program, and we are working to make this um, as adaptive as possible to different settings. Uh, you know, in the context of a, of like say a, a healthcare setting or a, a clinic or something like that. You know, there there are promotoras working and. Uh, and this would be an, another uh, good curriculum to um, have and adopt. Um, I would say, um, based on the findings of this study, one you know um, uh, kind of uh, way to think about things is if you're an institution without an established uh, re relationship with a um, Latino community, um, you might look to partner with. Uh, informal settings that do. So rather than um, lead, uh, lead it as workshops in, uh, you know, a hospital, uh, and it just makes a lot more sense given the program aims to uh, recruit, train women, and lead workshops maybe through a church or, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, we did some work in a Latino-owned salon and neighborhood or businesses. Uh, anything like that. Perfect. Thank you. Because I think that's also part of a lot of the TA we provide as far as the National Latino Network is concerned. A lot of times folks are calling us as to how do we engage Latino communities and all of that, which is a whole involved process. But I think um, at the end of the day, is there's it's a question about investment. It's a, it's a question about understanding that um, the resource already exists, and how do we, how do mainstream or non-culturally specific organizations can engage into that, and also honoring that the leadership already exists. I think that's also very important. Um, all right, so any other questions? Here we go. Seems like questions are coming in. Um, let's see, a couple of questions. 
Um, could you explain a little bit more on the differences between líderes and promotoras, which I think has already been asked, but uh, and how are males able to inform and assist female victims in a manner um, where they where they will feel comfortable receiving the information? Okay, I'm going to address the first question first. So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, it's actually a really good question because it's not always really clear. Um, so when I talk about peer or promotora uh, interventions or prevention, I'm referring to a, a model of intervention. And uh, uh, the Lira is, is a community-based program. It is a peer model. Uh, and it's similar in some respects to uh, uh, promotora models. However, um, they have different histories. So uh, in the healthcare, uh, uh, in traditional services, right, uh, um, we had what was called community health workers and promotoras. Um, um, uh, programs developed um, in response to, uh, you know, some pretty serious um, and persistent uh, health disparities. Uh, and these programs have shown um, effectiveness in reaching um, hard-to-reach communities. And this includes uh, underserved communities that, uh, uh, and uh, Latino African American communities. So, um, the model of training a uh, 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 individual from the community who is not a professional to do, um, deliver uh, healthcare knowledge um, and um, workshops uh, has been used in uh, more traditional settings. Uh, the Lideres uh, program specifically was uh, developed um, not by, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, traditional um, service providers, but by uh, Latina community uh, domestic violence uh, advocates uh, in a community setting. So it is unique. Um, that said, it is uh, uh, informed uh, by uh, other research and peer models uh, and um, has uh, uh, kind of the best of, of both worlds in that way. Um. And the second question was, how are males able to inform and assist female victims in a manner where they feel comfortable receiving the information? Oh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think uh, the DDS program was designed uh, for Latino women, uh, and they don't necessarily have to be survivors of domestic violence. Uh, uh, and there has been some discussion about how to include an engagement uh, in a program like this. Uh, I think, um, you know, even there, there was some uh, uh, kind of discussion in the implementation of the workshops for this study because uh, the Lideres uh, uh, themselves wanted a female audience. And so they um, advertised um, to women uh, in the community. Um, however, uh, uh, a lot of men were interested and, uh, and I, I think could benefit. But a lot of it has to uh, come down to, I think, um, you know, are you including these, uh, these issues and gender issues uh, um, from the planning and training phase of implementation? And if so, it would require a bit of adapt adaptation. Uh, again, another point where a technical assistance from CASA could really help because um, my area um, obviously is focused on working with women and youth. Uh, but um, CASA de Esperanza, the National Latino um, Network, has a number of, uh, of researchers and practitioners who um, have experience uh, specifically in engaging um, men around the issue of domestic violence. And, and uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, um, PMVITO and uh, other programs that uh, uh, work to um, build uh, leadership among men. 
Thanks, Lily. Another question. Any tips for researchers working with Latino communities? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think um, it could be a, a whole another talk. Uh, and I do have another webinar <laughs> that I've done on uh, uh, culturally sensitive uh, research and evaluation with uh, Latino communities in particular. And, uh, you know, I, 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 if I had to um, leave you all with just one thing um, from, from that um, very broad and, uh, you know, um, um, kind of complicated issue of, of working with um, marginalized groups, I think uh, it would be the value of participatory methods. So um, participatory methods mean that you include your uh, research subjects and other stakeholders. So in this case, uh, the Lideres were a part of, um, you know, the, the brief sense of community scale um, has a very good and valid uh, um, Spanish translation. But um, I, I brought uh, that and the, the entire survey measure uh, to the leaders who uh, had input and made changes on language and things like that um, on the basis of their experience and working with the uh, community. Uh, and that continued throughout the, the entire um, uh, research study uh, with regular meetings. And um, uh, it also means using mixed methods. So um, using both, uh, you know, if all I had was the quantitative, uh, you know, that um, interaction effect and I saw those numbers for a sense of community, uh, it, w it wouldn't have been as meaningful without the qualitative data I had that um, um, highlighted the uh, workshop participants' voices. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? from our participants. Thank you all so much. It's been my pleasure to be here. It's, you know, always kind of weird not seeing everybody, <laughs> but um, it's uh, uh, been wonderful to, to share this time with you. And um, I'm very open. Uh, again, my email's there. If, if you have any, if you want to uh, have any questions or want to discuss something else, uh, in more detail, feel free to reach out to me. Great. Again, thank you, Dr. Macias, for um, leading this discussion. It's certainly been very interesting. Um, again, just a reminder for folks, um, this website will be uploaded and saved to our, I mean, this webinar will be uploaded and saved um, to the National Latina Network website. And again, um, the PowerPoint will be shared to all the participants today. Um, if folks are interested in receiving more information, around um, the organization. You can go to our website to nationallatinonetwork.org and re get registered and um, get more information around current events that are happening with the network and in upcoming trainings. Again, Dr. Macias, thank you so very much and talk to everyone later.